Church, and today we're kicking off a brand new Christmas series entitled Wish List. Wish List. If you guys have your Bibles, please turn to a very familiar story in your Bible. You probably wouldn't typically, uh, you know, connect it with a Christmas message, but I think as we go through this story, as we go through this message, the Holy Spirit will put it all together and it will be a blessing to you. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter number four, and we're going to start reading in verse number 35. Here's what it said says, on the same day when the evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep in the pillow, on a pillow, and they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And then he arose and he rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and they said to one another, how can, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I really love that 39th verse that says, and then he arose and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, peace, be still. Would you all pray with me? Father, we love you. God, we thank you for an amazing time of worship. I pray right now, God, that you would give us your peace, a peace that doesn't come from anything this earth offers us, but a peace that comes from heaven. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, as we get into this, I just want to speak to you for a few moments on this thought. All I want for Christmas is some peace. Would anybody say amen to that? All I want for Christmas is some peace. I know some of you guys have been fighting the hustle and bustle of the rat race of Christmas, and you just say, man, just give me some peace. I'm not sure about you guys, but here's what I'll tell you. I really enjoy Christmas. I enjoy what Christmas brings to our life, what Christmas brings to our world. I love to see all the decorations. Can we give all the people that came and decorated the church a round of applause? Because, man, they just look amazing. I love to see trees you know, lit up. How many of you guys already have your trees up? Wave a hand if you got your trees up. Hey, Amen. What's wrong with the rest of you all? You ain't got your tree up? Getting the Christmas spirit. Amen. I love to, you know, see kids at Christmas time because that's really what it's all about. By the way, your kids ought to be good for the next three weeks because they are going to be just kind of, you know, milking it for all they can get. But I just love the passion and the excitement of Christmas. I think one of the things that makes Christmas so special is I learned at an early age that this is the time of year that, that you can make a wish list and give it to your parents or grandparents. And this time of year, uh, you can have an expectation of what's ever on that wish list. You maybe or probably are going to receive on that Christmas morning. In fact, you can also say this. Most kids learn, at least I learned, to answer a question that's, that's, uh, that's given to you this time of year that really isn't given any other time of year. And this is the question that you anticipate answering all year long, whether it be your parents, grandparents, coach, teacher, whoever it might be. You're just ready to answer this question. And the question is this, what do you want for Christmas? And that's a great position for a kid to be in. It, I mean, you get to give your wish list to your parents, grandparents, teacher, coach, whoever. You get to give that wish list to the people that know you and love you and want to make all those wish list dreams become a reality. Can I ask you all a question this morning? What do you really want for Christmas? What's high on your wish list? You've probably discovered as you matured in life, the answer to that question has changed. The price has gone up and it's harder to find. When your child is young, the answer is easy. They gotta have the hottest new toy. They gotta have the, the, the hottest new doll. You guys remember all the Cabbage Patch craze in the 80s? You old people, amen, absolutely. You know, parents just fighting over that doll at the mall. It was crazy. But nowadays, I don't think it's that tough for the kids. Oh, you know, if your kid wants the latest and greatest toy, you just got to go to Amazon Prime. You know, pull out your phone, go to Amazon Prime. It's there in two hours. I mean, it's that quick, just like that. Now, if you're old school, you can go to Target. You can go to Walmart and just pick it up. It's that simple. But when your child becomes a teen, what they want changes. The price goes up. And it's harder to find. 
Now they want the latest game system or the latest iPhone, smartphone, or maybe they want the latest laptop computer or maybe the hottest new sneaker that's out there. And, and so now you don't find yourself, you know, going to Walmart or Target. Now you find yourself going to the iPhone store. Now you find yourself not going to pay less. You find yourself going to pay more store. Can I get an amen? It's just the way it is. And guess what happens? As you become a young adult, what you want changes again. The price gets higher. And it becomes harder to find. Now you're not even going to the pay more store. Now you're not even going to the iPhone store. Now, now you find yourself going to the car dealership. Now you find yourself going to the jewelry store. And what you want seems to cost more. Now I would suggest to you that if you live life long enough, what you really begin to look for in life cannot even be found in any kind of store. If you live life any Time at all, if you've gone through some seasons, if you've gone through some storms of your life, if you've gone through some issues that you didn't know how to handle them, if you had some death and sickness and heartache and some pain delivered to your doorstep, I can almost guarantee what you want for Christmas is you just want some peace in your soul. I guarantee you there are some people here that are old enough, been through enough, and they would tell you this, that there is nothing like having the peace of God in your soul. And the truth of the matter is this, that, that peace is pretty easy to understand. You can basically use the simple economic strategy principle of supply and demand. So when the supply, when the supply is low, the demand is high, and the price goes up. Can I tell you, my friends, right now more than any other time since I've been alive, the demand for peace is sky high. Everybody says they want peace. Everybody says, man, they want to have peace in their life. And I would suggest to you today that, that most of the things that we do in life, we do in the pursuit of peace. We, look, we work overtime. We work hard. You know, we work those extra hours just to get a few extra bucks. So, man, we think if we got a little bit of extra money, I can pay that extra bill just to maybe give me a little bit more peace. We work really hard at our jobs to become the manager of the people that we used to work with. Why? So that we can have peace in our job. You look around for somebody with new arms to embrace you and new lips to say that they love you because you think, if I just can find that person, man, then I'll finally have peace in my soul. People look for peace in a bottle. People look for peace in a pill. People look for peace in drugs. Why? What they're trying to do is they're trying to find peace from, their, from the temporary problems that seem to plague them every day in life. Can I just tell you guys something? You can own property all over the world and still not have peace. To have peace is better than riches. To have peace is better, to, it's better than, than fame. It's better than fortune. To have peace is better than being good looking. To have peace is better than anything that you can have in this world. I've known some really good looking people that have committed suicide. I read a story this past week about a guy that was a billionaire, had anything that money could buy, and he jumped off the top of a building that he owned. I had a good friend of mine that I thought everything was okay in his life, and he drank himself to death in the search of peace. I think about great entertainers like Michael Jackson. Can I tell you, with all of his wealth, with all of his talent, with all of his charisma, with all of his ability, he would have traded it all for whenever he went to bed at night, he would just have some peace. The supply is low. The demand is high and the cost skyrockets. In fact, at most funerals, you will hear these words, rest in peace. Because our hope for you is that you will find in death what you can never find in life. And that is some peace. Our hope is in death. That is what you'll discover. But can I tell you, my friend, death is no guarantee that you will find peace. You say, what do you mean by that? For if you die in your sins without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me give you some bad news. Death is just the beginning of your trouble. So how do you find peace, Brother Travis? I would suggest to you this Christmas season, but just not this Christmas season, but really in life in general, that pursuing, possessing, and protecting your peace ought to be the number one priority in your life. 
Because the possession of peace in your soul is the greatest thing that you can ever have. It's the greatest things that you can ever possess. It's the greatest thing to know that, that no matter what's going on in your life, that because I know Christ and, he's my, and he knows me and we're together and I'm filled with the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, I know that no matter what's going on, it's gonna be all right. It's gonna be fine. Of course, it's the pursuit of peace that the disciples are looking for in this story that we just read in Mark chapter number four, Jesus and his disciples. They've had a long day of ministering and they get away on a boat just to find some peace and they're crossing the Sea of Galilee and the Bible says as they're making their way, of course, an unexpected storm arises. Water and waves begin to crash against the boat. Water starts to come into the boat. So no wonder, man, as this storm is, is raging on, the disciples, they try to do everything that they know to do. And finally, in their desperation, they go to Jesus. Can I ask y'all a question? Why does it take us so long to go to God? They were doing everything they knew to do. They put all their experience to use. And they go to God, they go to Jesus, and they find him where? Asleep with his head on a pillow in the back of the boat. Can I just tell y'all something? There was nothing about that storm that disturbed Jesus. Jesus knew somehow, some way that there was no waves, there was no wind, there was no water that was gonna still rob God's purpose for his plan for his life. He, he just knew that. The disciples cried, Jesus, don't you care that we're all gonna die out here? How can you sleep right now? You said the same thing. God, don't you see what's going on in my life? Don't you see my kids are running every which way but the right way? How can you sleep right now? God, don't you see what's happening with my husband or my wife? Don't you see that, that I've got cancer? How can you sleep at a time like this, God? Don't you care what I'm going through? Don't you care what's happening? And you know what happens is we get mad at God because he doesn't respond the way that we want him to respond. And you guys know the story. Jesus wakes up, he, God, I can imagine he yawns, he wipes the sleep out of his eyes, he goes to the front of the boat and he looks at the wind and he looks at the sea and he, and he speaks to all the noise and he says something that I think every person here wants God to speak over your life. He says, peace, be still. And it was silent. As could be. I don't know about you guys, but I kind of come a, to a place in my life that's really all I want God to say to the storms of my life. God, don't you, don't you see the chaos in my life? God, can't you just say peace be still? Don't you see the trouble in my finances? Can't you say peace be still? Don't you see the sickness that has hit my family? God, can't you just say those three simple words over my life? Peace be still. And he says, peace be still. And the wind and the waves became calm. The water became like glass. So the question I have is this, how do you pursue, how do you possess, and how do you protect the peace that God wants you to live with and have? And I believe there's three things from this story that man, God just wants us just to really get into our spirit and get into our heart and get into our soul. Now, before I give you this first one, I feel like I just need to give you an apology because this first point, I, I work hard on my points, okay? I want my points to be challenging. I want them to be somewhat clever. I want them to be somewhat memorable. So I work hard on my, on my points. But this very first point, it's really not that. But as I thought about it, as I prayed about it, I just, I just got to give it to you the way I feel like God's gave it to me. Is that okay with everybody? Here's point number one. Here it is. You have got to go to God in prayer. In other words, you got to pray. You, you've got to pray. Now, you probably didn't come to church today to hear me say and give you some advice on what you already know to be true, but can I remind you anyway, you need to pray. Can I just tell you, my friends, as, soon, as, as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, that when you pray, you will experience some peace in your life. When you bow a knee and you have a little talk with Jesus, here's what I can promise you. Peace will quickly follow. Can I tell you, that's exactly what the disciples experienced. They prayed, they cried out to God, and they're going through this hurricane, and they say, Jesus, hey, wake up. And he wakes right up. 
Have you ever thought about that? He is so close to their voice that he could hear their voice more than he could hear the loudest thunder. He could hear their voice more than the brightest lightning. He could hear their voice more than the, the biggest hurricane. He heard their voice. Can I tell you, that's how close God is to your voice. That's how close he is. Can I be honest with you guys? I, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'm sure somebody's going to find this offensive. Here, here's what I'm going to say to you, and I'm just going to say it anyway, even if it does offend you. Whatever your prayer life is right now, it is insufficient. Whatever your prayer life is right now, it is insufficient. You say, Brother Travis, why would you say that? Well, if, you've ever, if you read the Bible, if you're a Bible reader, then guess what? You're going to be some what convicted by some things that the Bible says because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says pray continually. Ephesians 6, 18, Paul writes and says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Romans 12, 12 says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction and faithful in prayer. Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is near. He is close. He is there to all who call on him and to all who call him in truth. Luke 18, 1 says, and Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them. When you want to give up, don't give up. Always stay faithful. Always pray and not give up. The Bible says in Luke 6, 12, one of these days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and he spent the whole night praying to God. I just want to interject something right here. If Jesus, the God who created the heavens and the earth, made it a priority to pray all night long, don't you think you and I ought to have prayer as a priority in our life? I don't know about you guys, when's the last time you prayed all night long? When's the last time you really was on your face before God, broken before God, and you were crying out to God for God to move in your situation? When's the last time you prayed like that? Philippians 4, 6, and 7, you guys know this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, every storm, every trial, every trouble, in every situation, pray. Pray with thanksgiving in your heart. Present your request to God and look what happens. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Can I evaluate your prayer life this morning? You need to pray more. Would anybody say amen? You need to pray. I'm not saying you don't pray a little bit now, but I'm just saying that you know what? You need to pray more. We all need to upgrade our talk with Jesus. We all need to set apart some time where we spend with Jesus, where we have this conversation with him. Not just some time, but all the time. We need to pray. Now I'm thinking about this prayer that the disciples, they cry out to God. And I believe you can basically break it down to the good news and the bad news about this prayer that they've had with Jesus. The good news is this, that when they prayed, Jesus was already on the boat with them. So he was easy to find. They knew he was on that boat somewhere, which means that these disciples, they had enough good sense to know that they do not want to get in a boat that Jesus is not in. They said, hey, if Jesus isn't in this boat, we're not going to the other side. Can I just tell you, my friends, that is some great advice for life. That is some solid advice, man, to invite God into the boat before you set sail. Because it's a sad thing. Whenever you don't have God in your boat, you find yourself in the middle of the water and a storm rises up and you don't know what to do. Let me say it like this. Before you take that next job, make sure Jesus is sailing that direction with you. Before you stand at that altar and say, I do, make sure that God is in the center of that relationship with you. Don't you say, I do, if God's not there. Before you, in an emotional fit, throw up your hands and say, I quit, and you leave that job, you better make sure that Jesus is right there in that decision with you. You better make sure that he is following that same path with you before you just do that, my friend, because you do not want to get out in the middle of the water and a storm rises up and you don't know what to do. The good news is this. Jesus was already in their boat. But can I give you the bad news? The bad news is he fell asleep. You say, why did he fall asleep, Brother Travis? I don't have all the answers, but I've been in church long enough to, I've been raised in church. My parents were good parents. They brought me to church. I feel like I know church people. I feel like I know disciples. I know why Jesus went to sleep. But let me explain it to you this way. Sometimes when I'll take a, a long road trip, I drive a lot. You know, I'll invite my beautiful wife. 
Michelle to go with me. Now, I don't need Michelle to drive because I like to drive, but, but Michelle is my co-pilot. And one of the things I like for Michelle to do is to keep me awake so I don't fall asleep while I'm driving. And one of the ways that keeps, she keeps me awake is she talks to me. She'll say, we'll just have conversation. Hey, what are we doing here? What's going on here? What's going on here? But as she talks to me, it keeps me awake. Could it be that Jesus fell asleep because the disciples quit talking to him? Could it be that's why he just kind of wandered off? And Because here's something I know about church folks. That's what we do. We think we know it all. We think we've discovered all. We think we don't need any more help. So we just quit talking to Jesus all about it. I can do it. I can handle it. I don't need your help. That's all good. Let me ask y'all a question. Here it is. What are you an expert at? What are you so good at that you don't need the creator of the universe, that you don't need the God of this world expert advice on? What are you an expert on that you don't need God who created you, created your mind, created people around you, created everybody within your circle? What don't you need God's help with? What don't you need, what don't you need to let God in on? Can I give you a little another thought is this, that the thing that you're probably experiencing the most trouble with is the thing that you're probably not praying the most about? Can I tell you there is nothing, nothing, nothing that you're an expert on that you don't need God's expert opinion on? Can I get an Amen. Let me tell you all something. If you really want to pursue and possess and protect God's peace, you have to go to God in prayer. That's the first point. You've got to pray. But let me give you a second point. If you want the peace of God in your life, you have to have the right perspective. Let me say it like this. Your peace is tied to your perspective. Let me say it like this. How you see it is going to be how you survive it. What you believe is going to determine what will blossom. And what happens to many Christians is they come to church, they know the Bible, they sing the songs, they say amen, they shake a few hands when they come to church, they, they, they leave. And somehow, some way, through all of that, they, they become uh, pessimistic in their perspective. You say, how do you know that? Because the moment something gets goes wrong in their life. The moment the doctor says, hey, we need to do another, another scan. We need to do another test here. The moment somebody doesn't say, how do you at Walmart? The moment the unexpected bill comes due. What do most Christians do? We push the panic button. We say, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna get through this? All hope is gone. We'll never survive this. The disciples, they wake up Jesus. They say, how oh, don't you care about us? They don't come to Jesus and say, Jesus, hey, can you get up? There's a storm out here. You probably see, see, hear the thunder. Hey, is there anything you can do about this, Jesus? They come to Jesus and they say, don't you care that we're all gonna die? Don't you care about us? And you guys know the story, Jesus, he rebukes the wind, but he also rebukes the disciples. You say, why would he rebuke the disciples? He rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. The wind is blowing. The storm is crashing. And they ask a question. Don't you care about us? Don't you care what we're going through? Can I just tell you, my friend, if life ever brings you a storm in your life where you question whether or not God cares about you, can I tell you, that just really shows that you really don't know what God has already done for you. That's what that shows. If you wonder if God cares about you, here's what I'll tell you to do. Look at the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is not get your house cleaned up, make sure all the decorations are perfect, the food is right, make sure that, and pretend like your family is perfect and look like the Waltons. Make sure that, and then through all that with the right food, right decorations, pretending everybody's perfect when they're really not, then somehow, some way, God's gonna give you peace. Let me tell you something, that is a lie from the pit of hell. And that is not the truth. The message of Christmas is this, God knows you. He knows you're scared. He knows you need help. He knows you've wandered away. He knows you drifted away. And God comes to you. 
And he offers you the precious gift of his most valuable possession, his precious son, who's born to the poorest of the poor in the lowliest of places with no advantage at all, who lived a perfect sin-free life, who climbed upon a cross, thought of you all the way, who willingly took the weight of your sin and my sin up on his back, shed his blood to wash all of your sins away. So the next, thing you, next time you think God doesn't care about you, remember the message of Christmas. Remember how much God really cares about you. And if that isn't enough evidence, let me give you some more irrefutable evidence that God cares about you. He got you up this morning. He got you up in spite of all the sins that you committed yesterday. He put food in your belly. He put clothes on your backside. He put a roof over your head. He gave you a car to drive. Of course God cares about you, church. Nobody loves you like Jesus does. Nobody cares about you like he does. Nobody sacrificed that much for you. Of course he cares about you. Jesus looks at his disciples. He says, don't you guys have any faith? Look where I've come from. Look what I've given to you. Look what, look what I've done for you. Where is your faith? In life, there's basically two roads that you can walk down. You can walk down uh, fear road or you can walk down Faith Avenue and which road you choose to walk down, that is totally up to you. And I'm just gonna tell you as a child of God, you will lose your peace if you allow your fear to outpace your faith. If you allow your fear to become greater than your faith, I'm telling you what, when a storm of life comes, you are gonna sink. In every storm that you encounter in life, you have got to make a decision. Am I gonna see this through, my, through, through fleshly fear or am I gonna see it through the eyes of faith? The Bible says that if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, anybody here a Christian? Anybody here a child of God? Raise up your hand. Raise up your hand if you're a Christian. Not ashamed. Yeah, amen. Absolutely. If you're a Christian, the Bible says as a Christ follower that we are to walk by faith and not by sight, doesn't it? The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Verse six, if you drop down there, it says that without faith, without faith, it is impossible. I-M-P-O-S-S-I-B-L. Impossible to please God. Why? Because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is believing that it shall be so when it's not so, so it may be so. Let me say that again. Faith is believing that it may be so even when it's not so, so that it may be so. It is your faith that brings it into existence. My faith doesn't stick my head in the sand. My faith sees the sickness, but it believes in the healing. My faith, it sees the overdue bills, but it believes that my God, like we sang earlier, is going to make a way when it doesn't seem like there's a way. My faith sees the enemy, but believes that God is my shield and my protector. My faith, it sees all hell's breaking loose, but believes the Bible that says no weapon that is formed against me shall ever prosper. Anybody here? You have to see it through the eyes of faith. This past spring break, we took our three precious grandbabies to Walt Disney World, had a great time, and something we did was we went to Animal Kingdom and Animal Kingdom has a ride called the Bugs Life Ride. They changed the name. I don't know what it is now, but it's called the Bugs Life Ride. But anyway, we go in there and it's place is packed. It's pretty busy. And anyway, they give you these 3D goggles whenever you walk in and, and we kind of scoot to our seat. Mila jumped up on my lap. Mila is my youngest granddaughter. We got our 3D glasses on. We're just having a time watching this movie. Mila's reaching out there. She's smiling. She's laughing. But for some reason, she decides to take her glasses off. And I say, Mila, put your glasses back on. She says, I don't want to put my glasses back on. I said, Mila, if you don't put your glasses back on, you can't see everything coming at you. Mila, if you don't put your glasses back on, you can't see the movie the way the movie was made to be seen. Can I say to all the Milas in the audience who have taken your faith classes off, can I tell you, you're not seeing things the way God wants you to see things. You're not experiencing life the way God wants you to experience life. You're not experiencing the peace of God in your life the way God wants you to experience the peace of God in your life. Here's what God would say to you. Here's what I say to you. Hey, put your faith classes on and look at God at work in your life. Look all around you. See the things in front of you. See God working even when you can't see it. Can I get an Amen. You have to respond in prayer. You have to have the right perspective. Let me give you this last thing. 
you want to pursue peace, if you want to possess it in your life, and if you're going to protect it in your life, you have to remember his promises. You know, I preach this message, not this message particularly, this passage of message, this passage of scripture, probably five times in 15 years, 16 years since I've been here. And every time, God just gives me some new insight. It, it's amazing how that is. And I finally figured out why the disciples are so afraid. I finally figured out why they're so scared. You, you know why they're so afraid? You know why they're, they're so scared? Here's why, because they don't know how the storm's gonna end. They're uncertain about how this is gonna turn out. They're not sure if they're gonna make it. So naturally, if you're unsure, if you're uncertain, if you're afraid, guess what? It's gonna lead you to be anxious. It's gonna be, man, lead you to be full of fear and worry and, and, and anxious thoughts. But can I tell you, my friends, folks who know that despite the storms, despite the circumstances, despite the troubles and the trials, despite all of that, I know it's gonna be all right. I know we're gonna make it through to the other side. I know it's gonna be fine. Can I tell you, those folks, even though they go through some storms, can I tell you, those folks that have that kind of attitude, that kind of perspective, those folks don't live a life of fear. Folks who know that God's got it, that God's with me, God's in this boat, God's for me. I don't have to be anxious. I don't have to be worried. I'm gonna be active. I'm gonna be proactive. I'm gonna be intentional. I'm gonna do all those things that the Holy Spirit tells me to do, but I'm not gonna be full of fear. I'm not gonna curl up in a ball and huddle in my bed. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna, all those kind of things that just kind of the enemy wants to heap up on me and just say, woe is me. I'm not gonna push the panic button. I'm not gonna do that. You know why? Because I know God's in my boat. I know that God is with me. I'm not, those kind of folks, they're not anxious. But here's what happens with these disciples. They, they, they get in this boat and they start traveling and, and they just have totally forgotten what Jesus had said to them at the very beginning of this trip. You guys remember the very first verse I read, verse 35? We read this, here's what it says. It says, and when they got in the boat, here's what Jesus says, verse 35. He says, let us cross over to the other side. He didn't promise them that there wouldn't be some storms along the way. He promised them that we're gonna make it through to the other side. He didn't say that there wouldn't be some rough waves along the way. He promised them that they were gonna make it through to the other side. Jesus says, peace be still. And the storm went completely calm, just like that. Just like, and all the disciples, they're shocked. They're like, holy cow, what is going on? Who is this guy? Man, even the wind and the waves obey him. The Bible says they became more afraid. You know why I think they became more afraid? Is they totally underestimated who was with them. Can I tell you why we walk in fear? Because we totally underestimate who is in our boat with us. We just, because we want to grab a hold of it. We want to fix it. We're, we're, we're doers, we're fixers. And I'm not saying that if Jesus is in your boat that you won't have any storms. I can't say that. Because Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have some trouble, trials. But then he says, take heart, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. I wish I could tell you that if Jesus is in your boat, that that you wouldn't lose that precious loved one. I've, I've lost people very close to me that I prayed for. I'm not saying you won't go through some trials. I'm not saying that it won't hurt. I'm not saying it won't, it won't seem like it's unfair. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying to you is this, that without a shadow of a doubt, that if Jesus is in your boat, that he's gonna ride the waves with you. I can promise you this, that if Jesus is in your boat, he's gonna get you through to the other side. I'm not saying that you won't have some waves. I'm not saying you won't have some turbulence. I'm not saying you won't have some difficult days, but I am saying that he will get you through to the other side. And here's what I love about this whole story is this, the Bible says they made it through to the other side and it doesn't even say that they were late. They got there right on time, right when they were supposed to get there. Can I tell you something, friend? 
when you activate your faith, I don't care what it is you're going through, what storm you're in right now, when Jesus wants to, whenever he's in the boat with you, he will bring a quick and immediate end to whatever it is. And he's gonna get you through to the other side. That's what he'll do. If you don't get anything out of this Christmas season, my prayer for you as the pastor of this church, my prayer for you is that you will get a hold of God's peace. Because when you get a hold of God's peace, it will be well with your soul. And when it's well with your soul, it'll be well with your life. In 3 John 2, John says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health just as your soul prospers. When it's well with your soul, it'll be well with your body. When it's well with your soul, it'll be well with your money. When it's well with your soul, it'll be well with your marriage and in your relationships. When it's well with your soul, you're walking in peace. And when you're walking in peace, guess what happens? That peace of God starts to flow out of you and it starts to impact people around you. You start to spread this around because guess what? It's well with your soul. I didn't say it was well with all your circumstances. I didn't say it was well with everything going on in your life. I'm just saying that when it's well with your soul, it spreads out of you and starts to impact people around you. God says, I want to give you something that money can't buy. I want to give you something beauty can't buy. I want to give you something that popularity can't buy. I want to give you something from heaven. I want to give you my peace. And when storms come and when troubles come, please remember this, weeping Weeping will endure for a night, but there's joy that's coming in the morning light. That's the promise of God. When you have the peace of God in your life, you possess something. You've been given something. You have something that nobody can take away from you. It's the peace of heaven. It's the peace of God in your soul. And my prayer for you And what I'll say to you is this, may the peace of God be with you this Christmas season. May it follow you into 2023 and may it be with you for the rest of your life. Can I get an amen, church? Hey, would you all stand up with me? Father, we love you. God, I thank you, God, for showing us. God, sometimes even in a convicting kind of a way, God, that our peace is attainable, that your peace is real, that we don't have to be controlled by our circumstances, that we don't have to be overran by our problems and by our thoughts and by our worries and all this stuff that the world throws at us, that the enemy attacks us with, God. But you came to give us your peace right here and right now. So God, I just pray that it will happen. God, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice. God, if they do not live with your peace, if it is not well with their soul, that they would not walk out of here the same way that they walked in here. God, I pray that for that person, God, they don't know your peace because they don't know you. They've never really surrendered their life. They never really surrendered their heart to you. And now everything else that they tried to, to put in it, that place has let them down. So they realize there is something missing. There's a void in their heart. God, and that void is only something that you can feel. So God, I pray that that will happen right now. If you're here today and if you do not know Christ, if you've never surrendered to the God of peace that comes through knowing his son, Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that right here and right now. If you're here today and if at one time you were walking with the Lord, but you drifted away and you just say, man, I just need to recommit my heart, my life to Christ. I gotta, I gotta get that peace back. I invite you right here and right now just to recommit your heart, recommit your life to Jesus Christ. This will be the greatest day of your life, my friend, whenever you do that. It's the greatest decision you can ever make when you surrender to the God that created your life. You say, how does it happen? It happens when you call upon him, just like the disciples did. You call upon him with a humble, repentant heart and you say, Jesus, save my soul. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that right now, right where you're sitting at. Or recommit your heart and life to him. Wherever you're at, I just invite you just to say this. If this is the heart cry of your life, say, man, I just need to do that, Brother Travis. Just repeat this after me. Dear Lord, Forgive me my sins. I repent of my sins. I invite you to come into my life. God, I need your peace. I surrender all that I am to all that you are. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. I receive it right now in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just keep praying, please. 
If you're here today and if you said that prayer for the very first time, or if you said it as a recommitment, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count to three. And when I hit three, I want you to raise up your hand because I wanna pray for you. The Bible says if you're ashamed of him, he's ashamed of you. If you confess him, he confesses you. So if you said that prayer and if you meant it, acknowledge it. Don't be ashamed of it. Man, I, when I hit three, I want you to raise up your hand. Nobody looked around. This is between me and you because I want to pray for you. One, Jesus Christ loved you so much he died for you. Two, he was buried and rose again. Three, just raise up your hand all over the place. Hey, God bless you over here. God bless you. Amen. I see those two hands. Anybody else? Over on this side, you said that prayer. Commitment or recommit, raise up your hand. Maybe you're here today and you're a believer. You're a Christian. And God spoke to you about your prayer life. Let me just ask you, how many of you guys, God spoke to you about your prayer life? It needs to get better. Raise up your hand. Raise up your hand. Man, oh, yes. I got my hands up, by the way. Maybe you've been trying to fix some things in your own strength and in your own power, and God says, why don't you just come to me? Why, why did it take so long? Just come right now. Maybe there's something pressing in your life. Maybe you got a heavy decision in front of you and you just say, God, I just need your wisdom. God says, the Bible says that if you ask for it, he'll give it to you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to connect with you. He's so close to you. He's so close to your prayer. Maybe you're here today and you just live a life of fear rather than faith. It's just, your, it's just the way that you are. Can I tell you, my friend, you need to change your perspective. How you see it's gonna be how you survive it. How you see in life. Are you seeing it through the eyes of fear? Or are you seeing it through the eyes of faith? Some of you need to come to this altar and say, God, give me the faith to believe what I can't see. But I believe in you, Jesus. I know that you're real and I know that you're gonna handle this, God. So Father, right now, we just open up this altar for every person here, God, that would just come and pray. Just take a knee and bow, God, and just, just lay every burden down. Lay everything that just distracts him and holds him back from your presence. Whatever it might be, whether it's a big decision, maybe it's a relationships. I, I don't know, God, you do. So God, we just right now give everybody here a chance to respond to your voice. So I pray that we will be obedient and we will just follow you. We will come to you. We will come running to you, God. God, and you'll just give us that peace. We love you, God. And we respond to your voice right now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. I just wanna give you an opportunity to come and pray right now. Our praise team's gonna sing. This is your time to respond. You got something to pray about, pray. Come, pray. I'll be right here, I'd love to pray with you. I will tell you this, I'm gonna be at the altar. I'm, I'm gonna be at the altar. There's some things I need to pray about. And I don't know what you're going through, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I just invite you to join me as our praise team leads us.